All right, so I would like to introduce you guys to uh, Professor Veronica Santos. She earned her BS degree in mechanical engineering with a music minor from the University of California at Berkeley in 1999. She then went to work for Gagnon Corporation, specializing in life-saving cardiovascular technology. She earned her master's and PhD degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell University, while a postdoctoral post research research associate at the University of Southern California. She helped to develop a biomimetic tactile sensor for prosthetic hands. Her research interests include hand biomechanics, human machine systems, prosthetics, and robotics. Please welcome Dr. Santos. Well, thank you all for uh, staying out late with me and hanging out with me for the next hour. Um, my talk is called Helping Hands Engineers and Engineered, and the reason I made it titled that is because I wanted to tell you about the kind of stuff that we're doing in my lab, which would be the engineered hands, but I also want to tell you about the crazy path that I took to get where I am today. Um, one of the main takeaways of this talk is that there is no right career path. I think you guys should just do what makes you happy and eventually, hopefully, you end up in a career that, that makes you happy. And um, engineers, we're all about helping people. So that's the other part of Helping Hands. So these are some of my early interests when I was growing up. Um, I love taking apart things. And so this is not the exact same stationary bike, but I always took apart my dad's stationary bike that had you know, a cable-driven speedometer and odometer and all that stuff. And then I hurried to put it all back together before he wanted to use it again. Um, I was interested in Star Wars and all that sci-fi stuff, like most engineers. And I was really interested in a lot of things that involved a lot of dexterity and very detail-oriented things. So jigsaw puzzles, um, playing piano, doing origami, juggling, all that type of stuff. But if I had to cite one event early on that really put me on this path towards researching hands, it would probably have to be um, this injury from sophomore year of high school. Pretty lame injury. It happened in the last period of my class on Friday. It was PE. I was playing basketball, and I was dribbling around one of my friends, and I totally got swept off my feet and landed right on my elbow. So I went home. My dad said, oh, can you, can you move it? I said, yeah, I can kind of do it. He's like, oh, okay, it's probably fine. My mom gets home, and she's like, no, you got to go to the ER. So I go there and find out that um, this bone is not supposed to be chipped off and hanging out there, and this bone is not supposed to be rotated. So what they did a couple days later was they put in a screw. So, you know, this wasn't the most severe impairment, but what ended up happening is um, I had a very limited range of motion because once they put you in that cast, it really limits what you can do, and then your joints start locking up. And so about a year later, when I still had a really limited range of motion, you know, was, I was having trouble scratching my head or reaching to brush my teeth, um, I had a second surgery, and Dr. Uh, Ed Diao was the surgeon from the University of California, San Francisco, and they went in and they removed some scar tissue. And the hope was that if they get rid of that scar tissue, it'll loosen up the joint, and then with a lot of uh, rehab, I can get my range of motion back. And so these uh, pictures here show a bunch of the stuff that I had to do at home, in addition to all the stuff that I had to do at weekly physical therapy with physical therapists pulling on my arm and, and doing these bicycle um, exercises. So of course, you get sent home with elastic bands to try and strengthen your muscles and, and pull your joints past their limit. Um, this thing always scared the crap out of me because it would stimulate my muscles and cause them to contract, but it would also shock me a lot of the time. Uh, this was a continuous passive motion device. I actually had this thing, and I would have study groups um, at my house, and while we were studying, my arm would be in this thing, constantly moving my arm. And then this last one is a spring-loaded splint, and you can think of it like um, your braces. So it's constantly putting a uh, force on your arm, either for flexion or extension, and every few days you crank it up so that it applies more and more force. So all of this stuff really made me think, well, geez, my injury wasn't that severe, and yet I have to do all of this stuff just to try and get that little bit of range of motion back. And it made me realize how much 
about my body I took for granted uh, until something breaks. And also just seeing other people going through their rehab therapies for gait, um, for mobility, and other more severe impairments made me realize that I wanted to do something to make this process a little more efficient and possibly enjoyable or effective. So around that same time, I was um, checking out a bunch of different summer programs when I was in high school. And I think the first one that really made me realize, okay, I want to check that mechanical engineering box when I apply to uh, undergrad, is when I went to Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. And we were exposed to all the different disciplines of engineering. And um, I came back, and I was obsessed with recreating the leaf blower hovercraft that they showed us how to make. So I made one of those things, and it was uh, a lot of fun, especially getting my mom, finally convincing her to sit on it. And then I'm running to get the camera, and I turn around, and she's starting to drift down our very steep driveway. And there's no brakes, but you know, she, we're OK. okay. So uh, anyways, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, around that same time, I also did a summer internship at Cal. Um, I grew up, I'm a Northern California girl. And I, I grew up in that area, and that's when I discovered soldering and circuits and, and really fell in love with that kind of stuff, the art of putting stuff together. And so that's when I really realized that, hey, there's something called engineering. It's like math and science put together. I can put those together. OK, and then, and then I, I made my choice um, on the specific subdiscipline of engineering really in a naive way. I, you know, I thought, oh, chemical engineering, I don't feel like being in a lab coat. Electrical engineering, I might get electrocuted or something. I do like soldering. Mechanical engineering, I like gears. I like seeing how things work. And so I really I checked that box. And then when I actually got to Berkeley, um, I ended up liking all my classes, you know, dynamics and controls and all of that stuff. So, um, you know, when I was at Cal, I got a mechanical engineering bachelor's. I did a music minor. Um, these are just a few of the things that I, I did while I was there. Um, I was with the Society of Women Engineers for a long time and worked my, up, my way up from outreach all the way to president by the time I was um, senior year. I worked on the uh, super mileage vehicle. The, uh, I, I did um, a lot of community service. I, that's where I got my first taste of uh, publishing. I was able to actually write a paper on piano string vibration for one of my technical writing courses, and it got published in the, the Cal magazine. So I was excited about that. And with all that going on, somehow I was able to keep my grades up, which made me eligible for a bunch of different honor societies. I threw this picture up here because um, this is one of the things that was totally non-academic and something that I really love doing. And I encourage you guys all to just think outside the box in terms of what ASU has to offer. What I used to do was I volunteer ushered at Zeller Bach Hall. And so every month or so, I would see a really amazing show for free. And all I had to do was take people to their seats for like an hour. And then I got to sit and watch the whole show. So that was a really fun thing to do. So the main takeaway is to just be a part of the larger campus community. There is much more than engineering. If you want to get minors and, and do all sorts of extracurriculars, um, I encourage you to do so. One of the things that um, I did as an undergrad was I volunteered in a lot of research labs. I didn't have this awesome Fury system that you guys have. Uh, if you haven't heard of Fury, you got to check it out. It's the Fulton Undergrad Research Initiative. And basically, it's awesome because you get research experience and you get paid for it. And it's awesome for me because I get really top-notch students because it's such a competitive program. And, um, and you know that didn't exist when I was an undergrad. So I basically volunteered everywhere. And one of the labs I volunteered in was uh, Dr. Liu's lab. And he actually um, had a side interest in Taekwondo. And he would do consulting where he would test the effectiveness of Taekwondo helmets and vests and so on. And so what we did, uh, this was already set up by a master's student, but I, I came on and helped with the data collection. There was a crash test dummy you would put on different types of helmets with different models of uh, types of padding and locations of the padding. You'd take this five pound projectile that had this steel base with uh, specific rubber on the end, and that was supposed to simulate someone's heel. And then you put it in this pneumatic cannon and shoot it right at the head and collect the accelerometer data from inside. And that's where I learned basic data collection, working in a team, how to create um, you know, charts of data. And uh, that was a really good experience. So messages apply for Fury or volunteer in a lab. Another uh, internship I did around the same time was with uh, Dr. Kazaruni. And uh, I actually worked on 
the chassis for the computer system that was already designed for this pneumatic assist lift machine. And so this device was designed to augment the strength of humans to try and prevent um, injuries, workplace injuries, for medium-sized loads that people weren't really thinking about at the time, 30 to 50 pounds. So imagine this guy loading uh, pallets or bins at the post office. Okay. And you don't want them to develop back injuries and all sorts of things. So using pneumatics and that hand handheld uh, ball screw with an encoder, you could sense the intent of the user and augment the lifting force. And the other project that was going on at the same time, I uh, was not actually part of this project, but I saw it being developed from the ground up um, before Dr. Kazaruni hit it big with DARPA funding to develop an exoskeleton to carry 300-pound you know, loads for soldiers while they hiked and ran and everything. And um, so like most technologies, a lot of it comes from funding from the government that eventually makes it out to uh, the civilians. And they spun off a company called Exobionics. And uh, this is the clinical version. So that's Austin. He's the primary pilot of this device. He's a UC Berkeley student, and he really wanted to walk across the stage to get his degree. So he still needs some support from that walker, but he is out of his wheelchair, he can stand eye to eye with people, and that makes a big difference. And one last internship I did as an undergrad was actually at the uh, Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. And uh, for the summer, I worked with Christine Wright Ott, who is an occupational therapist, and she works with children uh, who, uh, she actually developed this device called the GoBot. And in, in order to enable them to develop socially and explore their surroundings just like other unimpaired children, um, this GoBot allows them to use a joystick to navigate their environment. So you can imagine that a child that can't move doesn't have the ability to crawl over and you know, grab that rattle and explore their environment. So that's a, a very important part of the development. And one thing I did for that project was to create a, a quick assembly uh, mock hallway for children to train in that mobility aid. But the thing I had the most fun with was developing uh, the strap-on tray for disabled users of a communication device. So the idea was that uh, some users would use this device to uh, type out words, maybe to, to speak for them, but there was really no way for them to wear it very easily. And you know, you need two hands to type, and, um, and you need it to be supported by something. And so what was really cool is they let me just have the full run of their machine shop. So I was able to scavenge and use foam padding, uh, belt, seat belts, uh, thermoplastics, brackets, all the stuff that they use to create custom wheelchairs and, and other custom devices to create a cradle for this blue keyboard that could be easily lifted and then dropped back down. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, I basically was able to design that from scratch. Uh, from start to finish. And this internship actually came out of um, just going to a conference. When I was an undergrad, I was at Berkeley. I saw that there was going to be a rehab robotics conference uh, at Stanford. And I thought, hey, I might as well go check it out. It doesn't cost much to go, and it's local. And while I was there, that's where I met Christine Wright-Ott. 
And that's what got me the summer internship. So networking is key. Oh, and there is going to be a rehab robotics workshop at the end of February next year. It's going to be at ASU in the MU, and we've got a really awesome lineup of speakers, and it should be free. So you guys got to check it out. There will be some really great talks, and you can uh, mingle with a lot of great people in the rehab robotics community. Uh, also around that time, my mom sent me a newspaper clipping, and I remember being really amazed by it because it showed this this man, Mr. J. Titch, and the picture was of him throwing a ball to his dog, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize that he's a quadriplegic. And he was using this freehand system where they embed these wires and these electrical stimulators, these electrodes, and he would be in control of when his muscles in his arms would be stimulated to actually grasp a ball and throw the ball. And this is a picture of him holding his arms up in the air. Um, his quote is, my hands were everything to me, and without Hunter Peckham, I would not be using them today. And uh, this is Dr. Hunter Peckham, who you know, developed that free system and has been working on that ever since you know, his, his grad school days, I think. Okay. So we'll come back to him a little later. But what I realized from that was that engineers can really help improve quality of life for people, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. I can use my math, my science, I can build things, and I can help people. So when I was about to graduate from Berkeley, I wasn't exactly sure if I was going to get into grad school or get an industry job, so I put my eggs in all the different baskets just to cover my bases. I ended up getting into both, and I deferred uh, my grad school to go to industry. I actually took a pay cut to go to Guidant to work um, on stents and uh, angioplasty balloons instead of going to you know, Idaho or Vancouver, Washington to work on HP printers. And so even though I took the pay cut, I was able to work on something that I felt was really rewarding. Um, have you guys heard of angioplasty? Raise your hands if you've heard of angioplasty. All right. So basically, when your arteries get clogged with plaque, one of the things that we can do in a non-invasive way is to make an incision near your femoral artery, and then thread, the surgeon will thread this catheter uh, all the way up to or this uh, balloon all the way up to the occlusion, thread it through whatever little lumen is left in that um, plaque area, and then inflate that balloon. And what it does is it very primitively pushes all the crap out to the outsides of your artery to open up the lumen again so that your blood can flow, so you don't get heart attacks and, and strokes. And if you're a uh, type of person where, through genetics or diet or whatever, that plaque keeps coming back, then one thing that you can do is actually put a permanent implant. So what you do is you take these balloons, and then you um, crimp down a metal stent onto that, metal scaffolding. You thread, do the same thing where you thread it through the lumen, and then expand that balloon and permanently deform the metal. And it just stays in your artery holding things open. Okay. This can still close up again, but it uh, sometimes works better for people than just the plain angioplasty. And so out of that, and I keep getting notifications that you know ideas that I had when I was there um, keep spitting out patents, so that was a lot of fun uh, for me. And also that's where I met my husband, Ryan, and um, after that I kind of have been dragging him around the country for my career. He's been very supportive. For grad school, it was about a year and a half after I had my stint as a quality and R&D engineer at Guidant, I went back to grad school and um, I went to Cornell. It's funny because I just I happened to walk by a Cornell table at the Berkeley Career Fair. I wasn't you know, Cornell wasn't even on my uh, radar at the time. I ended up getting in. I ended up visiting. So if any of you become interested in grad school, I highly recommend visiting places before you choose one because it's a it's a big commitment that you're making. And uh, I ended up being advised by Professor Valero Cuevas, who is well known for taking robotics concepts and applying, to that, applying them to the human body, specifically the hand. And so I like to say that I worked on live human hands, dead human hands, and computer simulated human hands. So that's where I learned how to do a lot of motion capture techniques, uh, collecting fingertip forces and torques using load cells. We actually dissected uh, human hand specimens 
and picked out different muscles and uh, screwed in eyelets, took fishing line and routed them to recreate the patterns of the different muscles and, and tendon lines of action, and then hooked up a bunch of motors and played puppeteer on this thing. Uh, and then m the bulk of my thesis was actually taking a clinically based model of the human thumb, which has five degrees of freedom, and transferring that into a roboticist language so that other uh, roboticists could use that. So the main thing about this model of the thumb is that there are five degrees of freedom, but there's no reason that the human hand has to be as simplistic as an engineered hand with orthogonal and intersecting axes like in a U-joint. And so that's what made this particular model complex. And about a year before I graduated, that's when Brady came along. And the message from this is if you keep your grades up, get lots of undergrad research experience, get summer internships, you can actually be competitive for fellowships that will pay for all of your grad school, or at least pay for three years of it. Some of the more competitive ones pay for three years. And if you join a very good active lab, then that professor is writing grants just for you, and you will never have to pay for grad school, no loans or anything. So keep that in mind. Um, this is one of the legacies of the PhD work that my model that, that we created was actually implemented in a, a robotics grasping simulator, which is now freeware, so you can actually download this um, and check out the DH parameters and apply those human hand kinematics to grasping and measure the grasp quality for a bunch of different objects. Okay. Since this is the adventures in engineering talk, I thought I'd bring back some of the, the weird coincidences that I noticed. Once you get really into a field, you'll start realizing what a small world it is. Um, when I was a grad student, I went to an American Society for Surgery of the Hand conference, and there was a guy giving a keynote, and it was the guy who did the surgery on my elbow. And then I went to another uh, biomedical engineering conference, and there was Dr. Hunter Peckham from that really inspirational newspaper article that my mom had sent me. And I actually keep running into him at conferences for different grants, and it's uh, a lot of fun. And there's one more weird connection I forgot to put on this. Um, that internship that I had at Stanford that came out of me just up and going to that research conference, I was flipping back through the research conference uh, program, and one of the organizers was Professor Valero Cuevas, who ended up being my PhD advisor. And I had no idea who he was at the time. So it's a really small world with lots of, lots of weird connections. So after my grad school, um, I went and did a postdoc. It's pretty common to do a postdoc when you're interested in going into academia. So I worked with Dr. Jerry Loeb, who's very, very well known for um, helping to invent the cochlear implant, functional electrical stimulation devices called the Bion, which are like rice-sized electrodes that you inject into muscles, and then you can wirelessly um, power them and cause them to contract. Well, when I was there, I studied uh, tactile sensors and these are just a few of the different models um, before we actually, they actually developed it into this commercially available product called the Biotech. And uh, what this is, is a tactile sensor that's inspired by the human fingertip. It has a rigid core, like the bone in your finger, an elastomeric skin, like your own deformable skin, and then you inflate the skin away from the core with a weakly conductive fluid. And you can measure a bunch of different things with this in a human-sized package. So on the core, we have electrodes embedded. And there are 19 electrodes so that when you touch a surface, you deform the skin, which deforms the fluid volume. And you can measure spatial temporal changes in impedance at all those different electrodes. So you can basically measure how the skin is deforming and use that to relate it to force being applied to the fingertip in 3D, uh, center of pressure, so where on the fingertip it's being contacted. And then basically for free, if you tap into that fluid volume and put an off-the-shelf pressure sensor, now you have yourself a hydrophone, and you can pick up the vibrations at the skin. And so you can use those vibrations to relate it to texture or detect slip or uh, any of those fast, uh, fast stimuli. And also there is a thermistor embedded in the end uh, that can measure the rate of heat conduction away from the fingertip. We don't currently use that, but that thermistor has been shown to be uh, relatable to material properties, for example. So if you hold your, this finger sensor on a metal or wood or plastic, or whatever, they have different uh, rates of heat conduction away. 
And what I learned from this um, was that research can actually be translated and make that leap of, across the valley of death from the lab bench to industry. All right, so that brings me to uh, ASU. And um, I remember telling a friend that I got a job as assistant professor. And they said, who are you the assistant to? And I said, well, no one really. I have to do teaching and build a lab and mentor students and write proposals and publish or perish. And, but the benefits are that I get to uh, decide who I work with, what I work on, um, you know, I can still study human capabilities like my PhD work, but I can actually reinvent myself as a roboticist. And so now uh, in my biomechatronics lab, we study human hands, tactile sensors, and artificial hands. And about a year into my uh, position here, Olivia came along. So life happens. So I always like to show this video. This is in real time. Okay, this is 2013. This is 5.595 seconds. I'll let it play one more time because it's so awesome. And I really want those giant cups in the back. They really look cool. Okay, that's just him practicing. So this is what humans are capable of doing with a lot of practice. Okay. Now we start thinking about, well, how can we create those dexterous capabilities? Not that everyone wants to be the sports stacking champion or anything, but if you want to get back to your daily life and work on your hobbies and things that involve your hands, for people who, who don't have full control of their upper limbs, it's a big problem. And so these are just a few of the stats. I mean, you've got 10K upper limb amputations each year. That, that's an outdated number. Could be more now because we have a lot of people coming back who are survivors of um, military uh, conflicts. And they're coming back not only needing lower limb prostheses, but upper limb prostheses as well. You can have amputations at various levels, which makes the design of prosthetics very, very uh, challenging because everyone needs a slightly different type of, of functionality. So you've got finger amputations, uh, transradial, above the elbow. So you can imagine the more proximal, the closer to the center of your body that the amputation is, the more functionality you have to keep recreating and the more weight gets added and, and all the other you know, control complexities that you have to think about. And um, some of the top reasons for amputation include trauma, cancer, or um, you know, uh, compl uh, complications asso associated with other diseases like cardiovascular disease. But one of the things that's most striking is as many as 25% of upper limb amputees choose not to use any device at all because they are dissatisfied with them. So this is a huge engineering challenge that's just crying out for someone to be working on it. So why is it so hard? Well, there are a bajillion things you have to think about, and no one lab can do all this, but there's uh, weight, comfort. I mean, you can make this really beautiful upper limb prosthesis, but if people don't like wearing it, it's just gonna sit in the closet, and that's what happens to a lot of these things. Um, appearance, there's a funny trend that's going on now. You would think that people would want these uh, prostheses to kind of blend in so no one would notice them, but one of the trends with the, the military amputees is they come back and they like the high-tech look. So they're actually getting these uh, eye limbs with clear skins so that you can see the uh, artificial fingers underneath. Um, cost and accessibility, reliability is huge. If you have to worry about what the prosthetic hand is going to be doing and it's not doing you know, what you want it to do, even 5% of the time, you're not going to like it. Um, it says as, annoy as annoying as when you're trying to move the mouse on your screen and you're jiggling that mouse and it's very, it's either lagging or not doing anything. It's just frustrating. Imagine that's your arm that you're trying to control. Uh, the human machine interface is a gigantic problem. I'll show some videos about how some people are um, tackling that, that uh, problem. And uh, of course, functionality. 
So you do all this stuff, you can make it look really beautiful, but if it's not useful for activities of daily living, like buttoning your shirt or combing your hair or putting a belt around yourself, what's the point? Okay. Um, unstructured environments is a huge thing. So robots are super awesome in manufacturing setups where the environment is built around the robot. The robot knows exactly where to get that tool and exactly where it needs to go to put that weld or uh, spray that paint. But take that same super awesome robot and put it in your living room and ask it to get you a glass of milk. It's useless. So one of the grand challenges for roboticists now is trying to figure out how to take robots and enable them to learn and work in unstructured environments that they've never seen before. Novel objects, novel environments. Um, the bottom line from this is that it takes a village and lots of iteration. Many years of research and a lot of people working on all the different aspects of this. I thought it'd be fun to show you a few of the, the evolutions of, of artificial hands. This is one from 1508. And a lot of these things come from the battlefield. So this is um, a German knight's hand where there was a little uh, tendon system with a latching system that enabled you to basically flex and lock the forefingers and the thumb. This body-powered split hook from 1912 is probably one of, still one of the most commonly used artificial limbs uh, today because it's lightweight, it's cheap, it's easy to use, and even though we didn't grow up with hooks and, and screwdrivers and all that on the ends of our, our arms, we are very good at learning how to use tools. So this is just a hook with a cable that's just like the brake cable on your bicycle, and an amputee will learn how to move his or her shoulder in order to pull on this cable and open and close that hook. And one of the reasons why amputees also like this is because you get, dif you get direct force feedback from the whole um, uh, prosthesis directly onto the residual limb. And that sensation is really important for learning how to manipulate your arm. We also have a few prehensor devices down here. This is a body-powered one. This is the Autobach electric grifer. So now we're starting to get into the electrically powered ones. And this has been known to actually be so strong as to crush a tennis ball. Myoelectric hands, myo means uh, muscle. These are hands that are probably, um, in addition to the body power split hook, also very, very common. Um, they're commercially available, the ones that I'm showing now. And these up here, the Autobach, um, RSL Steeper, the motion control, these are all one degree of freedom. So they have five fingers, they look like they can do a bunch of stuff, but really they can only open and close. And the common way of controlling these is usually uh, two sets of EMG uh, channels. And so you might put one on your biceps, for example, another one on your triceps, and you flex your biceps to close, you flex your triceps to open, something like that. Very, very simple. Um, now we're coming out with more anthropomorphic and more complex eye limb and bee bionic hands. The, the challenge with those is how to deal with this communication bottleneck between human and machine. Because this hand can do, let's say, 24 different things. How are you going to control that with two channels of information? There are also uh, cosmetic passive hands. Um, some people just like to, to have the complete look, but they're not so concerned about functionality. And there's also task-specific attachments, but you can imagine you know, how limiting that is or how you have to carry around all these different attachments. So this is just uh, some of the anthropomorphic prosthetic and robotic hands that have been and continue to be developed both in industry and in academia. Right? There are a ton of them. And not every artificial hand has to look like a human hand. So there's a really awesome one that came out of Cornell recently from Hod Lipson's lab. And all it is is a balloon filled with coffee grinds. And if you put that balloon over an object, pull a vacuum on it, it will actually conform to the shape of the object and you can pick stuff up. And they have recently shown that you can actually reinflate that balloon really quickly and it will throw things, throw darts and throw balls and things like that. So you don't have to have a hand that looks like a human hand. One of the reasons why we like uh, anthropomorphic or human-looking hands um, in our lab is that it helps us to understand uh, motor control. 
we can interact with tools made for human hands and eventually um, improve the artificial dexterity of artificial hands and start working on things like in-hand manipulation where you know my, my three-year-old daughter can do this kind of stuff and move things around in her hand without setting it down, but artificial hands cannot do that yet. That's still a grand challenge. So there are a variety of different ways that you can control these different hands. Um, this one is called muscle cineplasty. Van Getty was the first person back in the late 1800s to, to think of using residual limb muscles and rerouting them um, and packaging them in skin to operate a prosthetic device. This is someone actually using that device. So once it heals, you can actually hook something directly up to that loop. And when that amputee contracts that muscle, it pulls on that loop, and you can use that like a little uh, pulley, pulley system. But the more common ways of controlling commercially available prostheses are uh, this two-site EMG that I mentioned before. And of course, it depends on what residual limb you have and what muscles are available. But if you set up a ground and then a couple pairs of electrodes, you clean up your EMG, you can use it to control the opening and closing of uh, a very basic you know, one degree of freedom hand. If you want to control something more advanced, there are a lot of people who are working on uh, pattern recognition. This is some work out of Michael Goldfarb's lab at Vanderbilt. So you can imagine having more electrode pairs and combinations of them to control different postures automatically by the hand. So one of the ways to simplify the process is to avoid this one-to-one -one matching of an electrode to a joint or an electrode to a finger, but connect patterns of electrodes to postures. So that would be like a precision pinch posture. Um, there are power grasps for grabbing larger objects. And this is a typical way that one might test the efficacy of a control algorithm that you're developing. Have an amputee come in and test them out and time them, look at the quality of the grasp, see how uh, much effort they have to put into controlling it. And then in the lower right-hand corner is another non-invasive way. Of course, you have to wear these caps. But um, if you don't want surgery, then um, a lot of researchers are working on EEG caps. And again, you're going to be picking up patterns of activity from the brain, through the skull, through the skin, and trying to relate it to postures or some other way to simplify the control of these really complex hands. This is work done in Andy Schwartz's lab. The out to grab and turn a handle with a robotic arm controlled not by its hands, but directly by its brain. With the power of thought, it can alter the speed and direction of the arm, twisting the joints to home in on its target. His arms are locked no down, so he's not from the able to move his arms. The electrodes in its brain to a computer. The reward for each turn of the handle, a drink of water. He's been trained to control that 11 Sky degree of freedom arm and get juice rewards or water rewards. The University of Pittsburgh to see just how close scientists are to helping paralyzed patients. Human trials are likely to start next year. The monkey learns this fairly rapidly and is very comfortable with it. As you can see, um, as that's the, the monkey feeding by, himself they, they using that using arm. This to grab a marshmallow body, that's so in space and it like reaches out, grabs it, and puts it in his mouth. The mind control works through a device implanted directly into the motor cortex, the part of the brain that governs voluntary movement. Electrodes pick up pulses within the millions of neurons and send them to a computer, which deciphers the pattern and strength of the signals to move the robotic arm. And he has to be very precise because that marshmallow will fall off if he knocks it the wrong way. At first, monkeys moved pincers to retrieve a marshmallow and feed themselves, a feat in itself. But the three-dimensional movement of a wrist is far more complex. You can see that the wrist and the arm itself orients very nicely to this doorknob so that we can twist it. This is all that connects the monkey's brain to the robot. A tiny plate, just four millimeters across, packed with 100 electrodes, 
each finer than a human hair. So we owe a lot to these very carefully designed and carry out, carried out um, non-human primate experiments. And you know, this was a video from 2010. Fast forward two or three years. The procedure and now you've got was this done by special. University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeon I've Elizabeth this Tyler Kabar, who showed us that the area that controls hand and arm movement is accessible right on the surface of the brain. What are the dangers? We worry about if we were to accidentally tear a blood vessel while we're putting them in, um, that we could cause a blood clot that would collect on the surface of the brain. Probably the thing we worry about the most is the possibility of infection. I mean, you do have a connection through the skull to the outside world. Absolutely. May I have some irrigation? During the six-hour surgery, two sensor arrays, each the size of a pea, were placed on the surface of Jan's brain. Then they were wired to two computer connections called pedestals, the gateways to Jan's thoughts. Five months after the surgery, we came back to see whether she would be able to control the robotic arm with nothing but her thoughts. They plugged her brain into the computer, and this is what we saw. I can move it up and straight down and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it, and I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really? Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Okay. Let me grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> That's amazing. What are you doing, Jan? What's going on in your mind as you're moving this arm around? What are you thinking? Okay, the best way to play is raise your arm. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, right. what did you think about when you did that? Well, not very much. I do it all the exactly. time. It's automatic. Is that hard work? Are you having to concentrate? It, no, it was hard work getting there. I struggled greatly to go up and down, getting now up and down, so we don't even think about it side to side. They didn't think about it. Just like, Just like that. your arms used to. Yes. Of course, many who could use a robot arm are not paralyzed like Jan. They're amputees. And for them, the project has found a way to connect the arm without brain surgery. 57-year-old Johnny Mathney lost his arm to cancer. Dr. Albert Chi from Johns Hopkins Hospital found the nerves that used to go to Johnny's hand and move them to healthy muscles in his remaining limb. Now, elbow extension. Sensors on his skin pick up the brain signals from the nerves and use those signals to control the robotic arm. Come here, I want to see you. <laughs> so even though the limb is missing, the brain still sends the signals as if the limb was still there. Correct. Johnny, it feels in, in your mind like your hand is, is there again? Yes. As if, as if your arm had never been lost. Correct. Unlike Jan, the connection for Johnny runs both ways. Sensors in the fingers send signals back so he can feel what he's touching. Okay, I'm holding the object. You can close on it. To see how well we put him to the test. Hard or soft? Soft. Correct. Very good. Now let's try again. I'm holding the object. Hard or soft? So, yeah, quite right. All right. He got it right every time. Hard or soft? Hard. <laughs> Amazing. The next person to have Jan surgery will have additional sensors placed in the brain to receive the sensation of touch. Andy Schwartz believes that will help with some of the things that Jan has trouble with. Okay. For example, Sometimes when she looks right at an object, she can't grab it. Okay, I'm going to take the cone away. Just go ahead and close it. Oh, sure. So as soon as I take the cone away, there's no problem. But as soon as I put the cone there, she can't do it. Why is still a mystery. 
So the bottom line is that artificial hands and their control have come a long way, but there's still room for improvement. So this is Mr. Jesse Sullivan. He's a bilateral amputee. He still relies on the body power split hook on his right side. And in this video, he's trying out this $400,000 DARPA arm using uh, targeted muscle re for control. In this particular video, he does not have any sensory feedback. He has to think about every single joint one at a time and basically uses visual feedback only. So what are we doing uh, in our lab and how can we address this communication gap between, or communication bottleneck between human and machine? You basically have humans and machines that speak totally different languages at totally different rates and now you want to put them together and have them work seamlessly. So humans have a high-level sense-think-act loop, and many people have already considered you know, creating that at a lower level within the machine itself. But the trick is to do it low level so that it's, it's transparent to the user and doesn't make the user feel like they've, their control has been taken away. So some of the things that we're working on are semi-automated, context-appropriate uh, subtasks that could be sensed by the hand and then automatically dealt with at the low level instead of having the uh, amputee do that or even uh, low-level reflexes that are as fast as reflexes that you and I have that are probably mediated by the spine that are you know, 40 to 70 milliseconds uh, latency so that an amputee doesn't have to think about that stuff. So we study human hands. This is just one of the experiments where we take two haptic robots. We have unimpaired subjects come in, and they're grasping an object that is created with um, six-degree freedom load cells. And then we use the robot to perturb the object in all different ways. And we study how the humans, uh, human subjects are able to respond to that. And what we found is that for different directions of rotational perturbations, you have different strengths of responses. And these types of responses can be used as templates for artificial reflexes in terms of latencies or directionally uh, dependent uh, strengths of the responses and so on. We're also uh, thinking very carefully about tactile sensation. This is uh, an art sculpture at the London Natural History Museum, and it's what the human body would look like if it were grown in proportion to the amount of cortex that's sensed from the different body parts and controlled the different body parts. And for so long, many people have thought a lot about um, how to control the hand, and only now are people beginning to really think hard about how we can sense from artificial hands and send that information back to an amputee or a teleoperator of any um, you know, grasping device. So what will we do with all this tactile feedback? Well, there's some very obvious biomedical applications that I'm particularly interested in. Um, you can go to the extreme of uh, semi-autonomy and imagine a wheelchair-mounted robot arm where you don't want to make someone who's wheelchair bound have to think about every motion of that end effector in Cartesian space and then opening it to grab that glass from the cupboard. I mean, you want to have someone be able to maybe use a laser pointer or something else to point at the object and the hand just goes out and gets it. And then you have, you know, dull, dirty, and dangerous. Anywhere that you want to put a robot where you don't want to put a human in harm's way to do things on your behalf, either teleoperated or completely autonomously. But we have a lot to live up to. In our own hands, uh, we have 17,000 tactile sensors that are very highly specialized, 2,000 in each fingertip even. And these guys um, you know, are superficial. They're deeper beneath the skin. They also come in these different flavors of measuring fast stimuli, like uh, slip and vibration, transients, as well as slow stimuli, like uh, location on the fingertip where, where you're being touched or uh, strain of the skin when you're grasping something. And so one of the things that, that we are working on, and actually Ruben is in the audience there. Raise your hand, Ruben. Yay. Ruben just graduated with his PhD, so clap for him. <laughs> one chapter of his thesis was developing this microfluidic tactile sensor skin. And the cool thing about this is it was designed um, basically out of an elastomer and a $6 thermometer that we got from REI. So um, gallon stand is a non-toxic sub substitute for mercury. We got that from REI, cracked it open, and injected it into these microfluidic channels that were created in Dr. Jonathan Posner's lab. And um, now we have, in this particular sensor, the ability to measure normal forces. So each of these little uh, squares there is the overlap of two 
uh, paths. And you can imagine that each of those squares is one capacitive plate. So when you squish this thing, it actually brings the plates together, and we can measure changes in capacitance, um, essentially changes in voltage related to the force being applied. We're also working with the um, BioTAC, which is the sensor I helped develop when I was a postdoc. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is learning through touch. So, you know, you've got really awesome, low cost computer vision systems coming online, like the Connect system, um, that will give you some vision of a cluttered workspace or what's in your surroundings so that you can go out and reach and grasp something. But there are a lot of places and and types of activities where vision is not going to help you. So when you reach into your pocket to grab your cell phone, what's a camera going to do to help you with that? So you know, reaching in the dark behind obstacles to find that USB um, you know, port, um, reaching inside containers, your pocket, your backpack. And what's really interesting is in the late 80s, uh, some psychophysicists ran experiments with humans and found that action and perception are really tightly integrated. So if I ask you, hey, how rough is that surface? You usually rub your finger across the surface, right? So depending on the type of property, substance, or structure related that you want to extract information about, there's a very characteristic motion that humans do. And one of the things that we're interested in is contour following. Because imagine um, that you're reaching into your bag and you're, you're looking for that book or that cell phone. You're not just doing this open close thing with your hand. You're reaching for edges, trying to find the corners and trying to find um, the two sides of the book before you grab it. And so as a first step towards contour following, first you have to find an edge and know how the edge is oriented with respect to your body, like your fingertip. And so uh, one of the experiments that uh, both Ruben and Randy did, Randy, raise your hand. Hey, Randy. Um, these two guys just got a paper accepted to um, a Transactions and Haptics Journal where we took 3D printed edge stimuli mounted on a, a turntable, motor driven turntable, and then presented that at various angles to our robot hand that had the biotech on the end and just let the robot go at it for thousands and thousands of trials. And you get all these data and you give it to a machine learning algorithm and you train the hand to learn the orientation of the edge based on tactile feedback alone. And we did that for different thickness surfaces, different contact forces, different contact angles, different fingertip speeds, uh, a lot of things that could vary uh, under naturalistic conditions. And in this um, diagram, you'll see that this is at half speed. As the finger moves across, these are the changes in impedance on those electrodes that basically tell us how the skin deforms. And that was the key to actually relating um, you know, the tactile sensation to edge orientation in this particular study. We've also uh, done similar things by exploring haptically bumps and pits and other things like that. We're also developing uh, our own custom robot test bed for grasp and manipulation. This is done in honor of Kevin Bear, who is one of the founding graduate students in my lab. And um, so the bear claw is actually his, his hand size. Fortunately, he was a big guy. He was a mountain biker and kayaker and rock climber. So we had big hands and could put all sorts of hardware in it. Um, so Randy has been working on this uh, tendon-driven remote actuation device. Uh, we've also been 3D printing the fingers of the bear claw, which actually are built around the biotech so that we can get that rich tactile feedback and have all the joints of a human-like fingertip. And I'd like to point out Eric Chang here. I don't think he's here, but he is a superstar undergrad who has been working in my lab since a freshman, since he was a freshman. So anyone can join any lab if you're passionate enough, and he is actually um, been, uh, you know, integral to the development of our Hall Effect proprioception system, which is inside this finger. So exteroception is how we sense uh, tactile information, for example, about us with relation to our environment. But proprioception is how I'm able to do this with my eyes closed, is how I know where my body parts are. And so um, by putting Hall Effect sensors in here and selecting all that stuff, that's how Eric contributed to that. So a uh, little over, I guess, a couple months ago, um, I saw this thing come to life for the first time, so this is really exciting. It's tendon driven, only two joints are being actuated right now, but now we can do more complex things with this test bed that we cannot do with any other commercially available hand and have the tactile sensation that is very rich 
in terms of vibration, skin deformation, and all that. So we're really excited about that. Okay, so last video I want to leave you with um, before some other parting words is uh, this. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be cool if we could have humans and robots working as seamlessly as this? One guy can do it in 5.595 seconds. Two guys can do it in 6.53 seconds. How can we get humans and robots to work as closely and well as that? I think uh, that's a challenge for you guys to be thinking about. Okay, so we were asked when we put together our slides to also throw in a slide of what would we do if we weren't in our jobs, current jobs. And so these are some of the things that I would be doing. These aren't hobbies. These are what I would be doing for my career if I weren't here being a professor. Um, I think it would be amazing to be a Pixar animator, uh, be a Disney engineer. Uh, I love to make things, so 3D printing things, uh, working with wood, making toys. I think that would be totally awesome. I also um, love photography, so if I could make that a career, that would be really amazing as well. And the last thing I want to leave you with are uh, my two cents in pictures. So uh, this one is to signify that there's no correct path for anyone. Do what makes you happy, and eventually you get there. And there's lots of zigs and zags and weird connections, and, um, but stick to your goals. Um, when I was an undergrad, I was told, don't go into the field of prosthetics. It's a dead, stagnant field. And I'm glad that I ignored that advice. Um, another one, follow your heart. Uh, this was scanned directly from my wallet. So I have this with me all the time. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Keep all your doors open. Okay, so try not to burn bridges. Try and get, keep your grades up because it opens a ton of doors and so on. Get your hands dirty. Do some internships. Um, make it happen. I mean, go out and knock on someone's door um, and try and get an internship with them. Uh, the last two have to do with, um, I would say, the three P's, which would be passion, priority, and perspective. So um, yeah, this is from Stephen Covey's Big Rocks demonstration. You can imagine the biggest rocks are the things that mean the most to you. So family, life experiences, things like that, friends. And the little rocks um, are less important things until you get to grains of sand that are like Facebook updates, responding to the millions of emails that you have. And the only way to fit this all into the jar is to put the big rocks in first and then pour all the sand and all that stuff in and it'll fill in the gaps. But if you do the sand first, you're not going to be able to fit all that stuff in. And so that's the way that, that I keep saying. And the last thing is basically, um, you know, Work is work, but you only live once. And so, um, you know, I, I highly recommend that you seek out new experiences and enjoy yourself, especially at ASU. There's a ton to, uh, that ASU has to offer. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to be counting my papers and patents. I'm going to be thinking about my relationships that I had. All right. So thank you. I actually take all different majors. I've had biomedical engineers, industrial engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical. Uh, basically, if you are strong in your core and you can pick up other things as you need to, I'm looking for students who are motivated and can pick up new skills, who are very independent. Right? So you can come talk to me after uh, this talk or send me an email. Um, this semester I'm kind of busy, but uh, in the spring I'm probably going to be taking undergrads again. Okay, so that sort of leads to the next question. What kinds of projects do students who are doing theory work on? Okay, yeah, we've got a bunch of different projects, um, usually working directly with a couple grad students uh, on their 
larger projects, but you saw Eric Chang worked on the Hall Effect Sensing System for uh, the Bear Claw Finger. We've had some students who have been using the Biotech to explore different surfaces and grasp different objects and during writing and things like that. I've had some uh, students working on other types of tactile sensing and, and data collection, but I try and find something where it's not just collecting data and building a, a, and creating, creating a plot. You're going to be reading the literature to figure out why anyone should care about what you're doing. Um, you're going to be designing your own experiment. And um, as long as it's in line with the vision of the lab, I let you have at it. So. All right, so speaking of being in vision in line with the, your lab, do you do any work with neurological integration? Yeah, actually, we have a really awesome group of collaborators here at ASU. Uh, Marco Santello, who's the chair of bioengineering, studies uh, human hands and postural synergies, um, EMG. Um, and uh, Chris Bunio, who's also in bioengineering, studies uh, visual motor relationships in both monkeys and humans. Stephen Helms Tillery studies also brain machine interfaces in uh, monkeys as well as. Uh, Sensor, sensation in humans, and he and I have a collaboration where uh, he was actually trained by Andy Schwartz, whom you saw in the video, and we take data from our biotech and give it to him, and they, they feed that right into the monkey's brain and train it to detect different directions of uh, slip or different types of high-level abstractions that we take from the data. There's also uh, Dr. Panos Artemiadis, who's in mechanical engineering, and he's working on exoskeletons, upper and lower extremity, as well as pattern recognition. So there are a lot of people here, and we like to work together and co-advise students. So lots of opportunities. All right, one last question. Mm -hmm. For those of us who have had sports injuries. OK. Will all of these feats eventually replace standard surgery, you know, using robots to perform surgery? Oh, using robots. Um, I don't know. I, I think humans are pretty tough to beat. I think robots can be used to enhance how humans do surgery. So, for example, um, uh, Intuitive Surgical has a robot uh, with those minimally invasive pincers that go in laparoscopically, and the robot can actually be programmed to filter out human physiolog physiological tremor. So if you try and keep your hand still, you probably have about 7 to 10 hertz of tremor that is just natural. So imagine trying to do that when you're doing neurosurgery. I mean, one of the ways that that uh, we can filter that out is through robots. But autonomously, there's maybe someday, but there's a long way to go. I mean, you've got the computer vision. Who's going to make the, the choices? How do you know um, that you're not going to accidentally you know, poke or skewer something that you're not supposed to? I mean, people are working on sutures and things like that, but I would ask you whether you would want your mom to undergo a completely autonomous surgery at this point, and you would probably say no. I would say no. But we're getting there. We're heading, heading towards there. Thank you. All right. Thanks for sticking around.